that sounds sensible. Yeah, okay, I'll let them in. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hi. Oh, hello, Rosie. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> hello, welcome. Hi. Hi. Okay. Everyone, we're doing the normal sort of dance of waiting for a few people to arrive and um, we'll do a bit of an intro in a couple of minutes once people have had time to, to log in. Okay, we've got uh, 22 people now, Henry. Great, thanks. We'll just give it a, a little bit more time. Um, just so everyone knows, we'll say this again, but we're recording this session, so um, we need to for our funders. So um, if that is a problem for you, I apologise, but um, just you can be mindful of that in whether you choose to um, put your video on or, or what you choose to contribute, but, but we'll be recording the session. Um, you can ask Ro uh, Kate and I, technical, not Rosie, you can also ask Rosie questions in the chat if you want, but um, you can mainly ask me and Kate uh, questions in the chat. Uh, anything technical not working for you, let us know. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I won't say anything more because I'll just have to repeat myself in a minute. <laughs> Okay, I think, yeah, there are 24 people here now. Great. And I think you should probably start. And I'll keep an eye on the waiting room, Henry, as we go along. Thanks, Kate. Um, brilliant. Well, um, yeah, so we're recording. Um, you can ask us questions in the chat as ever. Um, if, uh, I'm sure you've probably all used Zoom a lot by now, but if you haven't, um, let us know and we can try and help you out. Um, we will be sharing the slides afterwards, so don't feel you need to note everything down. The slides, if I do say so myself, have some good notes on them as well. So um, it's uh, you'll hopefully be getting sort of most of the content in a follow-up email. So hopefully that will allow you to um, engage with us a bit in discussion and some of the exercises and um, and get your thinking caps on. Um, so uh, we are going to talk to you about making the most of local media in your communications in Oxfordshire specifically. If you have no interest in Oxfordshire, this probably isn't the right workshop for you. Apologies. Um, uh, and this workshop is part of the Escalate program of social enterprise support in, in Oxfordshire, uh, which is uh, run through uh, Oxlep and OSEP, the Oxfordshire Social Enterprise Partnership. Um, and it's a great program of support available to you if you're in Oxfordshire social enterprise or a social business or charity that is interested in trading or you know it's quite a broad umbrella and the support includes workshops like these peer learning groups um, and uh, access to one-to-one -one support with Grant Hayward who may or may not be on the call actually um, so there's a, a bunch of great support networks and resources available um, at the end I'll put some information in the chat uh, where to find out more, but you can find out more on the OSEP website. Um, so I'll leave that there for now, just briefly introduce um, myself and uh, Kate. So my name's Henry, I am the lead coordinator of CAG Oxfordshire, so we're a community owned network of about 90 odd um, community environmental groups and community businesses. Um, so we're, we're in interested in sort of community actions to tackle climate change. Um, and my job and the job with my team is that we support that network to be as effective as possible in achieving, achieving their goals. Um, Kate, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, hi, I'm Kate Parinder. I work for Oxfordshire Community Foundation. Um, so we're a charity. We aim to improve lives by tackling disadvantage in Oxfordshire. Um, and we tackle the most pressing problems locally, which we think are homelessness education inequality and loneliness and isolation. And one of the major ways that we do that is by making about a million pounds worth of grants every year to local charities and community groups. Um, we've actually exceeded that in the past financial year because we've been doing a lot of COVID support grants, um, a reactive and kind of recovery grants um, relating to the pandemic. Um, 
yeah, and I've been responsible for marketing and communication since 2014 at Oxfordshire Community Foundation. I'm also a guide leader. And um, so I've been in that time kind of building relationships with local press and learning a lot about it myself. Um, so I'm going to share some examples of things I've uh, think of we've done well, but also not so well. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't want to set myself up as a major expert, we've, but I've got a bit of experience of things to do and not to do. Great. Thanks, Kate. And I think that speaks to our sort of overall approach here, which is about sharing our experience. Um, there aren't really, I mean, there are people who would say that they're experts in all of this, but I guess our whole premise of this workshop is you don't need to be that expert to, to, to do a really good job of, of working with the local media. Um, and we want people in this workshop uh, to learn from each of your experience too. Um, and at the end, we've got Jill Oliver joining us, um, who is uh, a local journalist with over a decade of experience, used to work for the Oxford Mail and the Oxford Times, and, and now uh, works for Tech Tribe Oxford. Um, and so do be thinking throughout all of this, if you've got questions for Jill, you know, Jill's the real, Jill is the real expert, the real insider. Um, and so we'll have a chance to ask Jill some questions at the end. Um, Briefly, what we're not going to cover, we're not going to cover the national media. Um, there's plenty to be getting on within an hour and a half just locally in Oxfordshire, uh, although, of course, some of the approaches will transfer. Um, we're not going to talk about interview techniques, um, but, you know, there are, we could, if you're interested in, in that, we can maybe signpost you some other resources. Um, and we're not going to cover, you know, your whole comms strategy. You know, it's really up to you to figure out what you're trying to achieve. Um, and... Uh, it's we're just offering some tools some approaches that you could use in ways that are going to benefit you and your organization so you know what you're trying to achieve will determine whether you know the local media really is a, is the right place for you to be spending energy on, on, on your communications efforts or or you know are you really trying to reach a specific set of funders or are you really trying to reach a particular local, local volunteers you know all of those things about what you're trying to achieve will influence how you need to do this work so Obviously, some questions for you there, but but um, we'll we'll share what we know, and uh, go from there. So, um, this is what we will cover, um, which is the good stuff. Uh, we hope, um, as you can see, time is tight, um, so we're going to keep moving through the content. And as I said, we'll be able to share the slides, etc., with you at the end. Um, so that's roughly what you should expect. As you can see, there's a couple of small exercises in there. Uh, Although there's lots of content, we're going to try and move very fast through it. Um, uh, there's a bit of space, hopefully, for some questions at the end and, and for some exercises to get uh, your input. Um, and just a note, Kate, I can't see the chat. So if there's anything coming up, just give me a shout. Yeah, uh, yeah, an eye on it. But um, yeah, lots of love for Grant in the chat. OK, great. <laughs> Hi, Grant. Um, uh, so uh, we're just going to start with some examples of best practice. Um, I'll start with the one on the left, which is um, one of our, the groups in our network is Cyclox, um, and they have a weekly column in the Oxford Mail called On Your Bike. Um, and uh, this is a great example to start with. Um, it's obviously, you know, it will take a, it'll, it, not saying you can get there next week, uh, but Cyclox have built a great relationship with the Oxford Mail over the years, provided them with lots of good content to the point where you know, they have a, a relationship with the Oxford Mail where they have a column every week where they can basically write sort of whatever they want uh, about cycling in Oxford. Um, and they use that platform really well, you know, for their campaigns and, and, and other things. But it's really a testament to them building a, a good long term relationship with, with the local media. Um, Kate's got a bit of a different example to share. Uh, yeah, this is probably our most successful bit of press coverage or one of the most successful. So this was the publication of our Oxfordshire Uncovered report. Um, and it's in its example of a sort of um, a, a story that had all the elements that the media like. So it had some surprising stats in it. It's a research report that shows the, what the kind of needs are in Oxfordshire. Um, and the whole premise is that, it, you know, Oxfordshire seems like a place of wealth and privilege. But actually, if you peel back behind the surface, you'll you'll find some pockets of deprivation. And that's us making the case for philanthropy in Oxfordshire. Um, and they love the fact that there were loads of surprising stats in there, even though we didn't generate any of that data ourselves. It was all in the public domain, but we brought it all together in this report. Um, they did a sort of 10 minute headline report on it, um, interviewing various people and in our, in our chief executive. So um, and that was on uh, BBC South today. Um, so that, that's an, and I can tell you a bit more about that later, how, how, we, how we did that and how well that worked, um, partly by um, error and design. <laughs> as always, uh, as always, Kate. Um, 
So uh, I guess there's a bit of a why bother, and I'm not going to spend too long selling you on this because obviously you've come to the workshop. Um, but here are some of my thoughts on on why local media is 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 a worthwhile use of your time. Um, so it's a great space. Uh, for local and community activists to speak on your issues um, and it's much more likely than the national media to run a positive story about successes and impact etc and um, it's also much less intimidating you know from pitching stories through to if you do get interviewed you know the presenters are much less likely to be hostile there's no there's no Oxfordshire Paxman as far as I'm aware um, for you to deal with um, and so it can be a really great place to start building your confidence and the confidence of your team and volunteers in sort of working with the media. It's also just easier to get coverage. It's a bit less competitive, or, you know, as you'd expect, like, you know, national news is you're competing against the rest of the country to get a slot there. Um, and uh, often we'll come to this, but often local media tend to be on the lookout for fairly easy stories. And, you know, if you do some work to make it easy for them, it's they're much more likely to run with something. You know, I've seen articles published on a local paper online that were 90 percent just copy and pasted from our email newsletter like we didn't even send a press release they just it was actually a bit annoying we didn't want them to publish that as a story but they did um so you know th these things can happen very easily um the influence and audience of local media has reduced over the years but it is still significant and it's likely to be slightly different from the other people you might reach so for example people who read a local newspaper quite different to the audience you're likely to be reaching on on social media um, and, you know, uh, apparently uh, so the, the publisher Johnson Press says that 11.5 million people read a local newspaper but don't read a national one. Um, and the trust in local media is often a bit higher than that of the national press. Um, so it's sort of, it's clearly an important source of news for sort of people in your community. And it also is, is, Quite influential more than you might think on local decision makers so whether that's your local council or your local mp you know these sorts of local political organizations will be, keep a real close eye on on the local media um so that's a bit of a sort of why um i'm gonna keep moving us through and now i have the challenge of trying to uh digest the, the oxfordshire specific media landscape for you in in 10 minutes um so you hopefully will recognize some of these depending on where you are in the county and, and whether you're a sort of local news uh, reader. Um, so here are the newspapers. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but it's worth noting that the NewsQuest group, um, they own all of the ones on the left hand side. So that's all actually the same company that produced those papers. And that's why you'll see a lot of the same articles in, on, online and in print that across those. And it means if you pitch a story to, to one of those uh, outlets then often that will get picked up in several so that's the news quest group um uh separate from that there's the banbury guardian which is published every thursday um the henley standard if you're down that part of the county um the 30 odd thousand oxford university students have their own weekly paper in term time that's the ox stew and the Sher Sherwell. um and there's a few hyper local examples that will be really relevant to you if you're in those areas so there's the lee's news for example um that is just one example of a sort of hyper local newspaper news sort of letter almost there's sort of a hybrid between a paper and a newsletter um so that's a bit of an overview of those um all of them have an increasingly online presence i think it's worth saying so they you know there's a lot most of those are in print but there's also uh, an increasing focus in online um we also have radio and tv locally um as you can see, uh, you know, what are they useful for? What sort of reach? Um, you can do some of the research online about who's sort of got the biggest reach and who, what, what sort of audience different stations have, for example. Um, I mean, BBC is, you know, in my opinion, the best. Uh, they've got the biggest reach. Um, they've got the, the biggest team of journalists, the highest journalistic standards, um, I think. And um, they also obviously are much more linked into a national organization. So stories kind of come up and down uh, sort of levels of scale I guess within the BBC. Um, Jack is also great uh, countywide. Um, uh, there's another whole other slide on Jack which I'm going to skip over but I'll send to you in the notes because uh, Jack FM very kindly at our sort of prompt ran a whole workshop uh, recently on on how to sort of pitch stories to them and what they're interested in so we'll share that with you and you can follow up with Jack but the main Jack FM is sort of aged 25 to 50 is their sort of target audience jack two is sort of the over 25s and jack three is sort of the over 50s as a target audience 
Um, there's a bunch of smaller radio stations like Whitney Radio, First FM Oxford, um, and a, a couple of others. Um, and some of those are just on digital. And so, you know, worth looking at if you're in those areas. But obviously, the, the main ones, if you're looking county wide, are going to be Radio Oxford and Jack. Um, there's also TV. Um, you'll probably be aware of the main ones, the sort of regional news south today, which covers quite a large area. And likewise, Meridian, it's not just Oxfordshire. They're sort of the whole sort of south, southern region. I can't tell you exactly where the boundaries of that are, but um, there's also that's TV, that's Oxfordshire. Um, I mean, I would basically sit there and say, don't really bother there. I think their viewing figures are, are pretty abysmal and I've never really seen much come out of that personally. So, I mean, just, just my personal opinion, but I wouldn't really bother with that's, that's TV or that's Oxfordshire. Um, but they are a local TV station in theory. Um, so now I'm going to skip you past uh, Jack FM. Uh, as just know it's there on the slides if you want to come back to it. Um, this is the sort of other section, um, which obviously it's, it's just going to depend on who you're trying to reach. You know, um, there's podcasts, magazines, the sector press, um, you know, for so some examples there, Night Shift, our local sort of music um, magazine, um, Tech Tribe Oxford, which is uh, Jill's uh, outfit who we're going to hear from a bit later they obviously are interested in sort of clean tech and and anything sort of local techie and digital um ox in a box does all sorts of like food and lifestyle entertainment across the county and is is a great sort of new outlet um so depending on what you do and what you're interested in it's really worth experience like exploring that you know there's cotswold life there's oxfordshire living some of these more sort of lifestyle magazines um which might be worth being in touch with um so, you know, do just think beyond your local paper as well. Uh, where are we going next? Here, we're going to move into something. Did I, did I manage to do that? Oh, just over time, but we're nearly there. That was your 10 minute overview. Uh, we're going to go to, uh, to Kate now. Yeah, so this is just a little quick sort of warm up. Um, and Henry's going to just open a poll. So these are three um headlines that i wrote for press releases for oxfordshire community foundation and i just want you to vote on which one you think is the best one out of those three so um here i can see the poll hope everyone else can can you just give us a little thumbs up to make sure that's working yeah um so please do vote which one do you, of those just on first look without thinking about it too much which is the best headline and then i can give you some feedback about which ones did and didn't work and why um yeah, there's a clear winner appearing. Um, and as you're as you're reading them, do have a little think in your own head about what why you think those are not so great or, or good working headlines. OK, so, uh, so maybe, most most vote. people have most people have voted. I'll end it there. Share results. OK, yeah, so Sorry, I'm, st I'm still reading it. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Um, Okay, so let's, um, sorry if you didn't get a chance to vote, um, have a look. So the first one, age-friendly Banbury pop-up on International Day of Older Persons. Um, some people have voted for that one, and um, that actually was quite successful, but I don't think when you first read it, it's kind of jargony. Uh, what's a pop-up? What's the Day of Older Persons? What's age-friendly Banbury? Um, so on first look, I can see why most people didn't vote for that one. Um, the second one, Christmas homelessness campaign of, uh, aims to avoid a tragedy of a return to the streets in Oxfordshire, and most of you have voted for that one, and I would agree that was the most successful headline, but not just because um, there's no jargon in it, it's very obvious what it's talking about, it also has a sort of element of urgency, and it's an issue that a lot of people care about, particularly in Oxford, and nobody's voted for the final one, I can't believe you didn't like my lovely um, headline there, o OCF transforms unclaimed client balances from solicitor firms into an asset for the community, what does that mean? <laughs> So um, I'll tell my mistake though on that final one is I did actually send that out to all of my local press contacts and obviously it's rubbish you know what's what's an unclaimed client balance um, who cares only a solicitor firm um, so an unclaimed client balance is actually quite an important thing to a solicitor firm I won't explain what it is because it's quite boring um, but if I'd have sent that to uh, sector press um, who understand what unclaimed client balances are and might be worried about them then this might actually might be quite an interesting and catchy headline, but I just 
pumped it out to everybody and obviously it didn't get any uptake because it no one knows what it means um the first one i just wanted to say a bit about that one because that one did actually get some really good coverage in the banbury guardian um so it's an initiative that we have in banbury called age friendly banbury but the person in our team who manages that project has a really good relationship with the banbury guardian and a particular journalist at the banbury guardian um that person has already published loads of stories about age friendly banbury so their readership knows what age friendly banbury is um, and this was a pop up was an actual stall in Bram Bambury town centre, um, which as a result of this media coverage was absolutely mobbed with people turning up to the stall and coming to talk to um, our, our project about age friendly Bambury. So um, it was actually more successful than you might have imagined by looking just at the headline. And I think behind that there's there's all the relationship building and um, yeah, the, the kind of long term situation with the paper um, this and the second one was successful but it was also successful because we had a relationship with David Lynch at the Oxford Mail um, who um, actually wanted to run a whole Christmas uh, homelessness campaign with us this is in 2020 and they and they wanted the kudos of being involved in a Christmas campaign despite not donating any money to the campaign but they pitched it as the Oxford Mail's homelessness appeal um, over Christmas and they ran five stories we planned them in every week leading up to Christmas and the week after and we we knew exactly what we were going to say for each one and he was actually chasing us on Monday saying where's this week's press release I want to put the story on the front page of the Oxford Mail um, so we tried to, to both have a really good relationship with them but also um, write headlines like this that would be sort of very obvious what they're what, what they are and, and, and give that sense of urgency about the issue um, so that's just a little bit of information behind the headlines and how you might use them differently. Thanks, Kate. And just to say on the poll, I think Zoom's a bit glitchy at the moment, and I don't know if it's closed the poll results for you, but you might have to close them manually because they're closed. Yeah, I just have screens. to close the pop-up. Um, but if you just pop those out of the way, we're done with that now. Um, and on to the next thing. So you're going to hear a bit more from Kate on this this sort of key bit of the workshop, really. Of like, what's your story? Yeah. So. Um, this is about how to write your story and how to make it a, a story that the press might pick up. Um, and I think the key thing here is to think about um, what is the journalist and the readership of your publication going to be interested in and not what you are interested in and you think is an important story. And those two things are not the same thing. Um, so I've identified sort of four things to think about when you're writing your story. And I think the top one really, if we go to the next slide is surprise. Um, they all begin with S, which I quite like. Um, so uh, this is a bit more information about um, that example from earlier that we got picked up through the BBC South today. Um, it is our Oxfordshire Uncovered report. And I've actually said it's the dark side of Oxfordshire. So that initially, it, you know, it kind of gives a kind of emotional feeling to it um, and maybe sort of intrigues you to read a bit further. Um, so it's really what's the story in our work. It's not necessarily um, something that matters to us right now, although this certainly does. Um, it's something that's going to be sort of shocking, impressive, quirky, topical. Um, and the classic example that people in comms use is the kind of uh, dog bites man uh, versus man bites dog. So if a dog bites a man, it's not really a story, it's pretty um, inconsequential, common occurrence. But um, if a man bites a dog, it's pretty unusual and funny. So um, something that's kind of eye catching like that, um, that, that's the kind of example that people that people tend to use and Jill may even say it again later I think she did last time um, so yeah uh, and something topical you know something that contributes to uh, either a national debate or something that's being talked about locally um, this is an old example so it's from 2016 um, and actually uh, uh, we're going to be publishing a new version of this report next year with the new census data so um, we're going to be bringing something quite topical into it saying you know the new data is showing that these are the issues in Oxfordshire these are the needs these are the why these are the areas in the county that have the most um, issues this is where investment is needed um, so this is what we were trying to do with this example um, so step into the shoes of a journalist um, for local media um, it needs to be local that sounds like it should go without saying but um, you can find a kind of local angle on a national story um, I'll give an example of that later on um, but yeah, they, they're getting loads of press releases and emails and contacts from people every day. So your one needs to hop out and, and catch their eye. Um, so that is to do with the headline. But what I wouldn't do with a headline is make it like really gimmicky um, or something that really doesn't make any sense when you first read it. Um, so I think this is a good headline because, you know, you can see what it's about, 
but you want to read more um, but you don't want to make it sort of too mysterious sounding if that makes sense because that looks like clickbait as well um, so yeah I think a part of this as with all communications is to understand who your audience is as well so think about which um, outlets you're pitching this to um, the Oxford Mail is a is a daily is a tabloid um, the Oxford Times is published by NewsQuest as well, but that comes out once a week. You might want to kind of vary your story according to which one you're targeting, um, but they do tend to syndicate the stories and, and publish them in, in both papers. Um, and what will, what will the people that you're talking to care about? So that's not just the journalist, it's actually the reader of the paper. Um, people who are interested in local issues, people who are concerned about some of the things that you might find in those papers. So read the papers yourself. Um, my husband always takes the mickey out of me because I now know all about local planning and road works and everything in Oxford and Oxfordshire, um, which we didn't before because I didn't read the Oxford Times or the Oxford Mail before. But if you, if you read them, you'll get a really good idea of the sorts of stories that are published there and how to write a story that fits in um, and that will be eye catching in this way. So it has an element of kind of surprise or novelty, um, not like my unclaimed time balances uh, story from before. Um, there's another example here, I think, if you click again, Henry. Yeah, uh, so this is the this is a local take on a national story. This was um, I th this is a piece of press that came out. This is The Times, um, but this came out um, just after David Cameron had stepped down as prime minister. And um, you might remember this story. He put a shepherd's hut in his garden and um, there was a lot of kind of outrage nationally, like all this sort of national crisis Brexit situation was happening and he'd just gone off and was sitting in his garden in a shepherd's hut. But the story broke because the woman who does the PR for the shepherd's hut company uh, wrote a press release about it. And I met her at a meeting at, a, at an event and she told me about how she did it. And it was really interesting. She, she just thought she liked that kind of parallel that there's this cabinet that is sort of falling to bits with Theresa May and there's this shepherd's hut where he's sort of chilled out in his garden and just the contrast, the juxtaposition of it um, was really quite amusing and it went went mad and the shepherd's hut company got loads and loads of extra orders. Um, so that's just a bit of fun really. Um, on to the next one. Uh, my second S was stats. Um, so I've just found that the press love to have a headline with stats in it. Um, and this is an example of where I've not done it very well. So here's my press release, pretty boring, grants now open, um, of interest to a small minority of people, and we can probably just pump that out to those people by email. Um, so my press release was about the grants opening, but to add a bit of interest in the second paragraph there where I've highlighted, I put some stats in to kind of bring it to life um, from some research that we had done. And that was the bit that got picked up. So this press release got really good pickup. And we got, again, coverage on BBC South Today. Our CEO was interviewed there. Um, and, you know, Oxfordshire Community Foundation, who are experts in the need in Oxfordshire, um, are, are talking about this information. This information, again, is in the public domain. It's not our research. Um, so they wanted the bit in the second paragraph, not the bit in my headline. And I should have put that up there in order to sort of frame the story. Um, and as a result of that coverage, then we got loads of grant applications because people were aware um, that there was a need and, um, you know, sort of indirectly the story and the outcome I wanted did work. Um, so, yeah, and it's, it's positioned us really well because we wanted to be to position ourselves as a kind of knowledge hub and, 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 and an organisation that understands the needs in Oxfordshire. and. Um, it was really nice that we didn't realise that about ourselves in this press release, but the, but the local press did. <laughs> um, uh, and if you go onto the next slide, Henry, I've just a little um, tip for you about stats. Um, so this is Local Insight, which is a tool that we now use um, to generate some of those stats and that data. Um, so this is a really brilliant um, demographic needs, anal needs analysis and mapping tool. Um, and it layers on hundreds and hundreds of different data points from things like the census, the Department for Work and Pensions, the um, data on housing, and you can zoom into very local areas and it will tell you what the needs are. It will compare the data in your local area to national data, which is what this um, traffic light colour coding is all about. So the areas in red are the areas where there's most need, um, as you can see. East Oxford is particularly affected there. I think that's the general indices of multiple deprivation there that are showing. Um, so we use this to generate reports about the needs in Oxfordshire, usually to coincide with a round of grants that's opening, um, to make the case for those grants, to make the case for people to apply, to help applicants to put, the, put that information into their application as well. 
and to make the case for funding uh, from philanthropists to go into that grants round. Um, so this is something that we use, but and it's normally a paid for tool, but we have made a version of it publicly available for anybody to use. So you can all go onto the um, link, which we're going to put in the notes here and have a fiddle around with this tool and, and play with it and see what data it could bring out for you. It's really, really useful to use in press releases. And that is where I got the, da the data for the previous example I gave. Um, we've also done a little demo workshop uh, on how to use that because it can be a bit fiddly. So if you're not a data nerd, um, there's a quick hour long webinar that we did a few weeks ago and there's a recording of that. And I've put the link in the notes here. So you will get that after this session. Um, so please do feel free to use that. That is our um, sort of resource that we want to share with you. Um, and so please do go and have a look. It's a really, really great tool. Um, moving on to the next one. So this is, I hope I'm not going too fast. I don't want to rattle through too quickly. Um, this is my third S. So structure, structure your story. And um, this is the classic um, way of writing a news article. This is what journalists are trained to do when they go to journalism school. Um, so uh, this is called the inverted pyramid structure. And the point of this is that people scan local media, whether it's a newspaper, um, a website, um, people read it in a scanning way. They don't read it like a book from front to back with chopping between slides. That's it, I've got that one back. Sorry, is that still full screen? I think I pressed a button by accident. Um, it's not, but we can still see it perfectly well. Okay, yeah. I'll leave it. Thank you. Um, so the point of this, yeah, people people scan stories. So you might do this when you read the paper, open the paper and read all the headlines or read the stories on the front page and then the headlines for the rest of it. Um, so your headline needs to have all of the important information in there. And if people only read the headline of your story, they would still have an understanding of what that story was about. So that's what I was getting at when I said, don't put a sort of mysterious um opaque kind of bit of information in your headline um, you know do what it says on the tin really as much as possible um, so put all your key information near the top the second paragraph needs to basically say the story again but with slightly more words and slightly more detail the third paragraph gives a bit more detail but really tells the story again um, and the who where what why how stuff needs to be near the top so it answers all, all the sort of questions that a reader might have about the story and then as you go down you're assuming that fewer people will read the, the bits further down the story, but if anybody chooses to read the rest of the story, they'll get some more interesting information. So that's where you put things like um, quotes from your case studies or from your um, director or your CEO, um, or from people who are stakeholders in a project. Um, and then on the back of a press release, and this is just how you write any new story, not just a press release, but something for your website, this is a really good tip for that as well. Um, on the back of your press release, that's where you put notes for editors where you say, you know, this is what the organisation is and does. Um, don't put that in the story, put that in the notes that they'll find any sort of extra information. Um, yeah. Oh, and the other important thing here, uh, which isn't really about structure, but it's a tip, I think, um, which is really important, is about images. Um, so if you're sending out uh, a story to the local press, think about the images that you're going to uh, include and you want them to include because they will just come back to you and ask for some photos so high res um, images original images taken from the camera um, send those out with the story so that they're ready to use them um, yeah I've put notes on all of those in the notes here which you'll receive afterwards um, so the moving on to the next one the final s is your speakers so this is one of the things I learned quite early on. I'd like work really hard on my press release and draft it and make sure it was all crafted in this inverted pyramid structure. And I'd get the quotes from various places and I'd just whack it out and think that I was finished. Um, and then what happened is the press would like it, rang me up and said, can we speak to the person you quoted at the bottom of your press release? Um, and I'd sort of go, oh, right. Um, yeah, I need to go and find their phone number. Um, I need to make sure they're available. Um, <laughs> so what I do now is make sure that I know who the speakers are, have checked with them, have notified them that they're going to be appearing in a press release, um, that, that, that a quote for that the press might actually contact them and like to interview them and have their contact details to hand, make sure I've got their mobile number, um, all of those things, not just their email address. Um, so it that sounds pretty silly, but I, you know, I, that's not something that I realized um, at the beginning. You know, I, I sort of hoped that the press would just replicate my press release, but they, they're journalists. So they want to get their own take on the story and they want to do their own interview um, if it's a good story. So it's really good that, that they'll be engaging with you, um, but you do need to be ready for that. So have everything ready before you send, before you press send on your press release. Um, your speakers have the purpose of 
presenting the thought leadership um, behind your organization or being the human story behind your headline. So um, on the left here is our chief executive, Adrian. Um, he's providing thought leadership. So on that unemployment story, um, he can sort of give some of the information behind it. Um, Mujahid on the right hand side here has one of, been one of our most um, sought after interviewees in recent times. He appeared at one of our webinars recently. Um, talking about his uh, community football organisation and how they'd leapt into action um, doing food packages for um, minority communities during COVID-19. Um, and the BBC interviewed him as part of an agreement for our webinar. And then uh, other journalists at the BBC heard his interview and he was so great and so interesting and articulate that he then appeared on four other BBC um, shows that week in the lead up to our webinar, which had the positive result of having lots more people sign up to our webinar and hearing directly from us. Um, so choose a good speaker who's going to come across really, really well. He's very passionate and articulate. Um, so that's why he's a great person. Um, and having a case study really to, to save on your behalf what how great you are. Um, it is really, really helpful. So uh, making sure that he mentions that we couldn't have done this without funding from Oxfordshire Community Foundation, for example, on the radio when he's speaking is, is a great way to make our case. Um, so yeah, and you need to be really responsive as well. So be aware that when you've sent something out to local press that they may come back to you and they need to hear back from you within about one or two hours. So if you know you've sent something out, keep checking your emails, provide your phone number, and be available to answer their calls. Um, otherwise, you may just lose the story. You need to be really responsive because they're working on such tight turnarounds um, in papers and radio and TV. Um, yeah, and prep your speaker as well. Make sure they mention you. Um, sometimes that's not always obvious. So you'll get this great coverage, but your name isn't in there. <laughs> um, yeah. Great. Thanks, Kate. And yeah, I think there's a couple of things so much to pull out there around like the human sort of aspect of stories is, is like so vital we find that a lot around talking about climate action you know who who your messenger is 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 kind of often more important than than really what they're saying yeah. you know somebody with a lot of credibility exactly yeah. Um, yeah. and that depends on your audience so uh kate also nicely segued me into how to get your story out there um we we've split this into two parts um one is pitching to journalists and two is building relationships um both important so we'll start with um with pitching um so once you've sort of sketched out what your story is you want to make it as easy as possible for the journalist to run with it and you and again just really emphasizing putting yourself in the shoes of of the local journalist that you're trying to reach so oxford standard sort of oxford male journalist day would be sort of they're producing over eight stories um and you know more and more over time under more and more pressure sort of financially so you need to keep it as easy as possible for them um so you know if they can't understand it the first time they read it uh, or it doesn't grab them the first time they read it it's likely to get passed over um and uh you can make it easy for them by keeping it simple with an email um there are there's no one way of doing this you know we're going to talk about press releases um but keeping it simple is really important um a lot of this is stuff we've already mentioned, but, you know, really basic stuff like putting things straight in the body of the email rather than an attachment just saves the journalist time. And I mean, it could be the difference between them bothering to read it at all or not. Um, yeah. And making sure you include your phone number, really vital um, if they want to follow up, if the reporter wants to follow up, either to get a quote or to ask some quick questions, um, then they're likely to call you rather than email. Um, and there is a bit of an asymmetry here, you know, like they'll often call you with, you know, five minute turnaround. And if you try and call them, you might be waiting for a few days to hear back. But um, but, you know, that's the that's the system we're working with. Um, so, yeah, good photos immediately. We'll come back to that. Um, you might even have some success by sort of tweeting relevant outlets or journalists, you know, particularly if it's real breaking news or has really good photo or video content and um, that can work. Um, but again, following up, giving them a way to contact you via phone is, is always really useful and important. Um, so I guess with all of this, one of the key take homes, I think, is, is it's there's no magic to this. It's like a good, simple email <laughs> with a follow up phone call. And you've thought about your story, you know, that, that there's some real basics to get right. But beyond that, there's no magic to it. Um, a bit more on phoning, you know, some people uh, really like it um it depends especially if you've got a relationship so we'll come back to that and the yeah, urgent things um mobile 
always better than landline, especially at the moment. Um, but likewise with the email, you know, they, you, they don't want you to call them and have a five minute chat about the weather or, you know, what you were up to last weekend or whatever. They want, they want to know what your story is. So get to the point. Um, and a couple of don'ts, you know, press time for a daily paper like the Oxford Mail, you're just not going to, it's, it's sort of mad rush time. There's no point calling between four to 6 p.m. Um, and again, this is going to link into the relationships piece, but don't bombard people with uh, sort of trivial stories or like low quality stories, you know, like you'll just get a reputation as a bit of a time waster. So, so, so ignore that. Um, and, you know, I think all, by the same token, don't be afraid to be persistent. You know, we, we interviewed a couple of different local journalists in producing this as well as drawing on our own experience. And, and you'll hear from Jill a bit later as well, but, you know, Journalists are also just humans, you know, they're, they're, they're often a bit stressed out, things get lost in communication, they get tons of emails every day, and some people would really value you being persistent, you know, like uh, someone said to us that being willing to annoy a journalist into contacting you can be quite powerful, you know, <laughs> I'll have to contact them or they won't leave me alone. Um, so, you know, there's no one way of doing this. Um, and if that's not working for you, if being a bit persistent isn't working for you, then maybe go back and think, is this really a newsworthy story? You know, that's the point where you need to, but don't lose cop, don't lose heart if uh, your first few attempts don't, don't get you any response. Um, one way of quickly um, sort of being able to get some news coverage is to comment on bigger stories. And we mentioned this, but local papers are often looking for low and, and, and in fact, you know, radio stations, et cetera, are often looking for local angles on national stories. Um, so here's again, Cyclox uh, getting on the front page of the Oxford Mail by just commenting. I don't this was more relevant <laughs> the first time we produced this workshop back in January, but you guys might remember this. Uh, Boris Johnson cycled five miles or something from 10 Downing Street and it was a huge media story for some reason. Um, uh, and, you know, that somehow Cyclox were on the case and managed to turn that into a front page story in the Oxford Mail for them to talk about the importance of cycling and how it's really, you know, we, we should really support people getting out on their bikes more at the moment. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, we'll come on to this, but the sort of relationships are key there as well. So press releases. Um, I have a bit of a mixed relationship with press releases. I find them a little bit daunting, but they're also a very useful tool. Um, and I think an important thing is to not sort of yeah not sort of build them up too much in your head they're they're, they're, they're not rocket science um they're basic at their heart it's you know it's a tool to help a journalist write a story so when you're writing one try and think like a journalist um you know a good press re press release will answer the sort of who what when where why questions of a story um and within reason the shorter the better you know um how you use it's going to be different you know if it's a huge story that you've been yeah you know, i don't know if it not just to you and your organization but if it's a genuinely big news story you know um a big significant campaign win for example that you've spent years on and, and it's you know got huge ramifications then then that probably merits a sort of a longer press release but if it's not a huge story you can keep it really short um so you have to write your press release in the third person so again, you're trying to write it as if you're a journalist. Don't say we did this or I did this. Say, you know, uh, I don't know, age friendly Banbury did X, Y, Z. Um, and uh, the quotes are really important. Um, you know, colour, uh, memorable, and if possible, using sort of metaphors and imagery. Again, this is just sort of good communications in general, but uh, particularly, you know, local media really like that sort of human aspect to come through a bit of colour, something to, to sort of make it real and human. Um, and if you're, what you're aiming for, and this again, doesn't always happen, so don't feel disheartened, but if the press release is really good, then essentially your dream is that they're gonna copy and paste it straight into their paper, right? Or, or they're gonna basically read it out on their, on their lunchtime news bulletin or whatever it might be. Um, so that's what you're aiming for. It doesn't mean that it will actually happen. Kate's already shared some examples where, you know, the, the story that you think is the story might not, might not really be what they're looking for, but that's really important. Um, I'm not gonna read through everything on the slide, but um, you know, uh, another th thing to think about with the press release is it can be a really useful tool for you in your organisation. Uh, you know, if depending on how big you are, how many of you are involved, I've been in sort of campaign groups where writing the press release has been really vital for us to actually agree what we're trying to say. You know, what is our story? What is the message? And then, you know, whether whoever's doing interviews or 
or speaking to other media, you know, you can all be on the same page and make sure one person's not off there telling a different story to the rest of the group or, you know, um, maybe undermining what the rest of you might be doing. So, so that's really useful. Um, and just again, remember, journalists will be receiving literally hundreds of these every day. And um, you that's what you're sort of up against. So uh, you need to do more than just send them to make sure they're read, you know, follow up emails, calls, building relationships, etc. cetera. Um, I think we're gonna be able to share, you know, just like an outline, OCF's example of, of their press release template, which isn't, you shouldn't use it, but it's a sort of guide to what you might be able to develop for your own organization. So we'll share that afterwards as well. Yeah, um, feel free to copy and paste it and, and put it in your own branding or whatever. Um, yeah. and make sure you change Oxfordshire Community Foundation to your organization. <laughs> but it, it just has some pointers based on what I said earlier about the inverted pyramid structure as well mm. and what to put in which paragraph, what to put in the notes for editors and that sort of thing. Yeah, How long great. Would you so um, pitching your story again, photos and video, you know, vary views on, on how important they are. And I think video comes in and out of fashion a bit, I think, in local media. Um, but journalists are definitely feeling the pressure to make their stories sort of newsworthy and shareable on social media channels. So, you know, generally photos and video is very good. Um, the better the quality, the better, obviously. Uh, Ask a professional if you can, maybe you know a friendly one, maybe a volunteer, maybe someone in your networks, maybe you can just brush up your own sort of photography skills. Um, really important to provide captions for the photographs as well, particularly if there are people in them. So they, the, 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 the outlet will want the names of the people in the photograph. Um, and again, the best thing here is to look at the outlet you're trying to get into you know look at the Oxford Mail as an example and see what what photos they put in their paper what do they show um, you'll probably notice there's a lot of people there's a lot of sort of quite close up shots um, you know uh, big groups stood together in front of a building not so great you know maybe if that maybe that's the shot that illustrates your story but it probably isn't you know probably a few people at mid-range heads and upper body um, maybe taking part in an activity, you know, doing something, whether it's you know, they're actually cutting the cake or the ribbon, or um, maybe they're like, you know, someone, if you, I don't know, say you run a pottery <laughs> a pottery business, it's someone who's actually doing the pottery hands on quite close up. Um, that, you know, that will be, I think, something dynamic. Um, and, you know, there's a few other tips in the notes, but uh, yeah, on video, you know relevant and good quality don't just think like oh we should there should be some video with this so let's make some video um don't put it in the email because uh, as, a, as an attachment because it's likely to get classed as spam or just be too big for the inbox um and so you can just say we have a video that shows xyz and then and then the, they can take you up on it if they want to so moving on through um this is the dream when the media comes to you uh so you have built some relationships or you have some profile in the community for whatever reason or you know it happens to be that a national news story makes what you do locally really relevant right now the media might come to you um and it can sometimes sort of generate a bit of a snowball um so i'll share a bit of experience recently from a group called sustainable wanted who are part of our network um and the story sort of came to them via social media and someone just on Facebook, I think sort of suggested Radio Oxford contact Sustainable Wantage. And this was a story about the sort of uh, people refurbishing laptops to give to children who didn't have access to IT equipment to use for school sort of earlier this year. Um, and turned out the sort of regional BBC were making this sort of, again, like a bit of a campaign for them. They were sort of picking up this story and, and they came started with Radio Oxford and then they were on South Today and then they were on the one show as well in the end actually um, and it was a sort of local colourful example of a national story and they were just really quick to respond you know it was like can you be on like South Today tonight and they were like yes <laughs> we'll make time for that um, and sometimes that's how it goes um, you know on the on by the same token a group that I'm a part of called Broken Spoke Bike Co-op you know we were like all lined up to do uh, an interview on cycle training on Jack FM recently and then you know Prince Philip dies and everything goes out the window and the, the news agenda totally changes so this can kind of cut both ways but it's important to if you can sort of be able to respond quickly and they responded quickly giving sort of a wide range of ability for interviews and also managed to quickly get some video footage that they could share so you know it's again it's sort of responding to the needs of the, the media organizations when they come to you 
and you can use it as an opportunity to start building a relationship with the journalists who you might be speaking to and that is what i'm going to come to next in fact i think is this is this uh is this one with you kate yeah yeah um yeah so if you click again another image will pop up this is uh, i think i've actually explained this example already pretty much so i won't go into any more detail but that's that's what i was alluding to at the beginning um it, it's not just about the press release or the story itself it's about the relationship with the journalist um and i i think we keep hammering this home but i think um when you're thinking about pr and uh, and press stuff you do think about I think I started out thinking about press releases, but really, um, if you know who the journalist is that is um, interested in or specialised in your subject area, for example, and you can go and find that out from the um, website of the Oxford Mail or the um, BBC Radio Oxford, they list their journalists and their contact details on there. Um, you can either send them a personal covering letter with your press release and say, I've just sent this out, but I wanted to make sure you see it. Um, and, and I thought that you'd be interested in it, but in this because of this because I know that you've written about this subject before um, or I've noticed that in the Oxford Mail you've had a focus on mental health recently and we actually have this case study that's relevant to that and um, would you be interested in finding out more or can I help you to get to sort of collate together some information um, I had an example of that recently where we uh, did a story with the Oxford Mail and um, Andy French said I actually find this mental health angle really interesting and um, you'd be pushing on an open door if you pulled pulled together some more case studies and another story about it um i say that but i haven't actually found the time to do it but um those words really resonated you know for him to say i know i know and trust that you'll give me a good story um because he he knows who i am um because i've just been sending him stuff and calling him and emailing him personally um for the past few years um, so that's really, really important, not just to sort of pump things out to a list and put people in BCC, it's actually set, sending a personal email. And sometimes I'll send something to him or to the Oxford Mail, um, someone else at the Oxford Mail saying, I want you to get this story first <clears throat> before I send it to anybody else. Um, particularly those Christmas homelessness stories, um, we did send them out to our wider press list, but we made sure that the Oxford Mail had them and they were under their noses first. Um, so they felt like they were getting kind of special treatment um, in, in a thing that they cared about. That works quite well as well. Um, so ask other friendly organisations if they can share contacts. Ask us um, if, if you've got a particular area that you are interested in kind of promoting in the local press. We might be able to give you some tips about who to talk to. Um, but as I say, the, the contact details are published openly. So you can just directly approach people yourselves and don't be afraid to do that. Um, and I think Henry's just said this really, but be really helpful wherever you can. So if you want to be the kind of person that they approach, um, don't see it as an inconvenience if they ask you for something that's a bit difficult to get. Um, be approachable, be responsive, be quick. Um, and some increasingly, particularly radio stations actually are under quite some pressure to build better community relationships. So I know that the BBC local stations um, are wanting to introduce more content on um, community stuff. Um, the BBC nationally has tasked them with doing that. Um, so there is a communities team at BBC Radio Oxford. Um, they had a make a difference campaign um, the year before last, I think, where they were looking for different stories each week and you could go into their um, recording studio and record your own advert, which they would play for two weeks. Um, Jack FM have been tasked to be more community focused. So there is a kind of openness here to you approaching them and saying, I've got a good story for you and it's mutually beneficial because I know that you're looking to kind of um, build these relationships and build your profile in this area. Um, so yeah, build, build relationships really don't just pump stuff out. That's the key message there really. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, this is pretty much the same thing. I think I've covered this already actually. And don't get disheartened if you don't hear back yeah, you know, Andy French, I was just talking about him. I mean, he didn't re respond to me for ages and sometimes he still doesn't. So it's just sometimes we don't have time and um, yeah, it takes a while to build that relationship. Yeah, and just, just to that, that, that thing of like, you know, th these are just normally people who live locally. They're just as much as part of the local community as you are. And, you know, we, we asked a handful of local journalists to speak to us to help us prepare this workshop. And everyone said, yes, you know, they're, they're, these are people that, do really want to help they they have similar priorities to you possibly um but they're just under a lot of pressure so it's just about understanding that 
Yeah. So research time. I think we You've got time for an exercise actually. I'm doing well. Yeah, great. Um, I hope you guys are paying attention because uh, it's research time. Um, the idea here is to go and look at the Oxford Mail website, or if you have a more local paper that you're interested in, um, maybe the Whitney Gazette or Banbury Guardian, um, we want you to go to their website and find a story about something that's either similar to what you do or a similar sort of theme or might be relevant to your group or organisation. So do actually go and do this now, try and find out who wrote it and then maybe see what you can find out about them. Um, and then just have a think what strikes you about it? What's the story about? What sort of images go with it? Have a look and then we might even have time to hear back from a couple of people, but we're not, don't worry, we're not gonna put anyone on the spot, but go, go and have a look now. I'm going to do it as well, see what I can find it might be relevant to climate action. Don't know if anyone else is on the Oxford Mail website, but the number eight most read story is currently washing machine bursts into flames, which gives you an idea of like the range of subjects they will cover. How are people getting on? Has anyone found something they want to they want to share, or is anyone really struggling to find anything? Hiya. Hiya. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, obviously, um, Film Oxford we're winning some projects at the minute, but we didn't really advertise them as as well as we could have. Um, but obviously, just what you're saying is like. You know, the first things that's happening is the cinemas are reopening and like having a link to that kind of national story is really interesting to actually write something mm. to advertise what we're doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a, I think it's a great sort of idea, uh, example of a hook, like a moment where there'll be some there'll be some sort of nice visuals and and you could maybe yeah get a bit of a story about the importance of film in sort of people's lives you know maybe people that really missed film etc things like that well, anyone also, else sorry also is a uh, mental health awareness week which obviously what we're doing are a well-being project so it, i'm getting loads of ideas now <laughs> mm. it's great it's great uh someone in the chat uh grant found something from Cherwell, uh the student newspaper in the chat and didn't even know that Cherwell existed and it's about all about social enterprise award which is which is cool and um, Judith found something about uh, fair trade written by David Lynch, but but nothing this year. So that I mean that's an interesting thing. You know maybe there's a maybe there's a follow up there. You know an email that says hi David. You know I, I've seen you've written about fair trade in Oxford before. And um, you know we're doing this coming up this month. You know would you be interested in writing a story about it or something like that? Um, or you know did you see that this year fair trade sales are up by thirty percent or whatever it might be? Um, I found a story that we put out back in June twenty twenty that was about um, community action groups responding to coronavirus and what they've picked up at the top is a photograph that's like a close-up of some volunteers doing some delivering. Um, they're actually not wearing masks uh, but that wasn't our photo I think um, and uh, the headline that they the sort of straight underneath the headline the top line is you know uh, dedicated community groups across Oxfordshire have delivered 36 thousand kilograms of food fixed 170 bikes and donated you know 150 laptops it's like re they really leading with the stats there so again just an example of of sort of catchy numbers uh, being a nice thing so it's a few more things coming into the chat i think we'll probably um interesting to have a look at those um would really encourage you to keep digging you know look beyond the oxford mail as well try and listen to some local radio and see what comes up um, yeah, lots of interesting things coming out there. We don't have time to come come yeah. to all of them. I'm just going to example from Claire about the clever spin by Blenheim. I mean, you're right that that 
well, one about the Blenheim planting trees is probably a press release by Blenheim. Yeah, exactly. Um, great. So Jill's just joined us. Um, Jill, we're just about to come to the Q&A and it's a great moment for me to remind everyone to uh, have a think about what questions you might ask Jill at the end and they're coming to that very shortly. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just going to, I think this one's back to me. I'm going to just, uh, oh, is it me and Kate? So some other tools you might want to think about. Kate, you wanted to mention local newsletters. Um, yeah, just briefly. Um, so you're probably aware you might get them through the door, you know, those local parish newsletters or community newsletters, um, the free little um, A5 or A4 newsletters that come through your door. Um, those are very easy to get a story into and it does go through everyone's door and I know a lot of people throw them straight in the bin. Um, but if you send, uh, if you find your local um, E -news a community newsletter um, contact and send them a little story that's exactly the right size for their newsletter based on what you can see that's come through your door they tend to go oh, thank you so much we're desperate for stories and they put it straight in as you write it um, so that's just a little tip if you wanted to reach in a, on a really really grassroots level in, into a particular area um, it's quite easy to find what the community newsletter is in that area great and I wanted to mention just about making the most of any media coverage you do get so it's always going to depend on what you're trying to achieve but you know, perhaps you want to make sure you share those stories in your networks and on social media, perhaps in your newsletter. Um, you know, perhaps you want to send it to your funders and say, look we're, look, we're making great progress or look at this great news coverage we got. Thank you for your funding that's enabling this. Um, perhaps you want to repurpose some of the content for your own website. If the copyright allows, you, you know, say you've got a, an Oxford Mail journalist who's come along and take some photographs of something you've done. You know, you'd have to ask them for the to be able to use that, but but you could. Um, of course, without laboring the point too much, use it as an opportunity to try and build a relationship with the journalist, you know, a quick thank you and a quick, or a quick thank you and here's what we're doing next, you know, would you be interested in, in talking about this? Um, and, uh, you know, according to Ofcom, about 50% of people who access local news do access it through, through social media. So, you know, make, it's a very easy win if you do get any press coverage to make sure you're putting it out there on your social channels. To help you make sure you know if you're getting press coverage, I would really recommend Google Alerts. Um, so you can put keywords in and uh, Google will sort of um, automatedly send you a notification if someone publishes something, whether it's a blog or a news article, or et cetera, uh, with some of your keywords in it. So at the very least, sort of your organization's name <laughs> is probably a really useful thing to set up some Google Alerts for because you, you may send out something to a journalist, they may publish it and not have the time or remember to actually say, yay, we published it. <laughs> you know, you might, you, might miss it, you might miss the fruits of your labors. So set up some Google alerts. Um, and finally, letters to the editor, um, uh, really relevant. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna sort of go into loads of detail here. Um, and this is uh, just an example that I like and I think is, um, it was actually written by a friend of mine and um, it was in The Guardian in 2016. It was a long time ago. It's only 100 words and it wasn't splashed all over the paper, but it has had literally hundreds of thousands of shares on social media and it's still kind of doing the rounds. Like every few months, I'll sort of, it will pop up on my social media channels. So it's just an example of like a small sort of media intervention that's had a really big reach because it's, because it's funny. Um, and you know a good example of making the most of things on local media like there are news articles about how viral this this letter to the editor was like it's sort of a bit of a, a cyclical thing um but the letters page is often one of the most frequently read pages of a publication um and it could zero cost obviously there's often letters pages in magazines as well so if you you know in a particular sector that's a really worth thinking about um and obviously local media is much easier to get your letter published you know there's you know, you write to the Guardian like this was, you know, there's going to be a lot of other people writing to the Guardian. Um, uh, it's also, you know, who's going to read your local paper and, you know, often your local MP or local councillors are much more likely to read things like letters pages in their local media. Um, so it's, it's useful to, to be influencing in that way. Um, and there's a bunch of tips uh, in the notes on, on how to make, write a good letter to the editor. I'm not going to go into it now, but there are some, some hints and tips in the notes for the presentation. So me and Kate have uh, very quickly <laughs> uh, rabbited on at you a bit um, about how we think you can make the most of local media in your work, but now is your chance to ask an expert. Um, so we're really pleased to welcome uh, Jill, um, 
who uh, can maybe introduce herself actually. Um, hi Jill. Hi Henry, hi Kate, thank you so much for inviting me along again today. Hello everybody, um, just very pleased to be here and yeah I'm, I'm, as Henry said I'm a journalist with Oh, 30 years experience. Um, that sounds grim when I say it like that. And I've worked across nationals, um, regionals, uh, magazines, newspapers. Um, and yeah, so any any questions you have, I'd be delighted to try and answer today. Um, Jill, I'm going to jump in. Someone asked a great question earlier, um, which I saved. So Julia asked, um, how important is the headline compared to the story itself? Oh, okay. So when you're submitting a story, you mean, to a publication, is, is that the... Like I think so, yeah. That's when it came up. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, well, it, it's actually totally unimportant. So um, so don't, don't get hung up on it and don't sort of worry about it because it's highly unlikely that the headline that you put on your press release or your email um, will actually get used in that form. Um, because every publication or radio station or TV station um, or magazine will have its own editor or sub-editor um, or journalist and they that's their job effectively to write the headline so don't, don't even worry about it you don't even need a headline actually if you don't want one you know great thanks Jill I think you've got a hand up Grant and and we'll come to you just invite anyone to either use the hand raise function or just say either write your question in the chat or, or put that you want to ask a question in the chat and we'll go from there. So over to you Grant. Yeah hi everyone hi Jill good to see you. Hi. Um, <laughs> first thing I have to say is I, I honestly think I've been frantically uh, on, a, on a, what, the WhatsApp group with Ashley and Rosie because I think this is probably one of the best sessions we've had under the Escalate program. I think it's fantastic, so well done. And I think we'll get some good value out of it actually sharing the recorded link if that's okay. But the question, um, and I do appreciate it is very much, you did say at the beginning, Henry, that it's very much about local press and media, uh, but you did touch on it just before you handed over to Jill there, knowing as well the work that Jill does nationally, um, I just wondered what the thinking is about how important it is to try to use local press to get some sort of national coverage. And I'm thinking of someone, I mean, under the Escalate programme, um, many of you will know Annabelle Padwick of Life at Number 27. She does some fantastic stuff and, and writes actually articles herself. But, but so, yeah, so I'm interested in that and, and Jill particularly through you and Kate also. Um, so what about that connection? Obviously, local media, great. And have you got any examples where perhaps national media have picked it up and it's made a real difference to a local organisation? Um, that's a good question, actually, Grant. Yeah, um, basically, um, all of the, the main regional titles, like including the Oxford Mail and the Oxford Times, they have um, deals, if you like, uh, links and, and deals with um, local news agencies. Uh, and the uh, those news agencies will uh, go through everything that's online and everything in print and then they will follow it up themselves and actively uh, pitch it effectively to the national titles so you'll often see uh, things moving from regional or local to national um, plus of course all the nationals uh, you know will will go through regional publications and regional radio stations and so on the BBC has its own system as well of sharing um, stories at local level are available uh, to other local stations and also to the national thing. So there is a kind of automatic system in place, if you like, for, for moving stories up to a national level. Great. Thanks, Jill. Um, do you have any examples of maybe a story that you've written that, that sort of moved around a bit? Oh yeah, actually there was um, there was one I wrote um, for the Oxford Mail where I'd interviewed a former Spitfire pilot, um, a very lovely woman in her nineties, and she lived in this fabulous house in Bampton. Um, and it just came up in the interview. I was obviously interviewing her at Spitfires, um, but it came up just in conversation that the producers of um, Downton Abbey had absolutely begged her to let them use her house, you know, as a, as a you know, as a location effectively for filming. And she had just said, you know, no way, basically, I don't want, you know, I don't want them all tramping through my house and so on. So, um, so it was kind of like the headline that we used in the Oxford Mail was something like, you know, um, 
Spitfire pilot shoots down producers of Downton Abbey or you know the Downton Abbey location that never was and that was a good example because that was spotted by um, the agency that has the deal um, SWNS that has the deal with the Oxford Mail and all the other regionals so they um, they contacted me and asked me you know to uh, basically so they ran the story and the story ended up in got quite a few of the nationals like the Daily Mirror I think the mail ran it. Um, so yeah, that's quite a good example, yeah. really. Thanks, Jill. We've got a few more questions in the chat. I'll just quickly read some of them out. So um, from a journalist's perspective and in terms of coverage, is there, do you see if there's a, a difference be between how sort of a charity and, or a social enterprise might be treated or how a sort of profit making company, even if it's a sort of with social aims, like, you know, yeah. is there a difference there or is it just simply about the story? I'd say it's about the story first. It's always about the story first. And if you have a strong story, and I know that um, Henry, you and Kate have already covered this in your presentation, so I won't blab on about it again, but, you know, it's, it, essentially it's the, it's really straightforward, you know, it's see if you can find a hook for your story, whether that's seasonal or whether that's um, around statistics or a new survey or a new report, some upcoming le legislation, a council debate that's going to come up soon, um, you know, uh, and then keep your copy short and simple, have very good high resolution, clear color JPEG images, offer an expert for interview, try and see if you can offer a, a case study. Um, and that's it. If you've got a good story, it doesn't matter really great i mean i think that's probably our workshop in about 60 <laughs> seconds so you've you've ruined our job there okay uh, <laughs> bye jill um jill i think this we've, we did touch on this but i think just your take on on the sort of the classic question do you, is it better to send your press release as a word document or put it in an email oh i would always say paste it into the body of the email definitely Right. Two reasons there. One is journalists are very busy. So often, you know, they haven't really got time to go clicking and looking at attachments. It's much quicker to open an email and immediately in 30 seconds, you can quickly scan the, the, the copy that's in the body of the email. The second thing is quite a few of the um, big corporations that own most of our regional and local newspapers, they'll have rules about don't open an attachment if you don't know where it's come from, you know, because of viruses and so on. Thanks, really helpful. I hadn't even thought of that, that side of it. Um, I'm, I'm always opening attachments, maybe I shouldn't be. Um, so um, someone has got a, a great level of ambition and I love it. Um, and so I gave an example earlier of, of Cyclox having a sort of weekly column in the Oxford Mail called On Your Bike. And someone else is asking, you know, if you wanted to try and get yourself, your organisation, a column, you know, a regular column in, in, in say, the Oxford Mail, mm -hmm. how would you approach that? Well, um, it's actually easier than you might think in that, um, you know, as, as, as I know, um, Kate just pointed out, actually, just as I came in, um, I agree with Kate that, you know, uh, newspapers, magazines, local newsletters, radio stations, BBC Radio Oxford, you know, they're always looking for contributors because they have to fill a lot of airtime or a lot of pages. So, um, you know, it's definitely worth contacting the editor normally would be the best person or the producer at the radio station and just asking look I'm you know this is what we do my my social enterprise or my not-for-profit whatever it is you do my business you know um, I know about this subject would you be interested in me either writing a column or appearing on your show or could I be part of a panel because even if you can't get a, a regular slot, they might invite you on to be, um, you know, panelist or something. So it's definitely worth asking, I would say. Great. And uh, I imagine there might be a rush of people after this call getting in touch. <laughs> so get in early, get back your column quick. Do um, it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, stay on this workshop, yeah. <laughs> stay on the workshop. Um, great. So someone is asking, if you work for an organisation who hasn't really engaged at all recently with the local press, yeah. Um, how would you start, how would you recommend starting, um, you know, to start to build that relationship? Oh, okay, so um, basically, the first thing starts with um, do your homework is how I describe it. So um, have a look around and see what publications there are in if, if you want, if you want local media, look to see what publications there are out there, 
actually listen to the radio show so you know when I say things like um, Radio Oxford you know do actually take the time out to sit down or, or drive around whatever you're doing or cycle and listen to Kat Allman's show or Lily's show you know listen to those shows because by listening to them you'll quickly get a feel of what kind of coverage what sort of guests they have on and, and it'll just all become clear to you and you'll be sitting there or, or cycling along thinking oh I could be I could go in and talk to Lily about xyz or I could ask Kat to be on her show da, da, da. same with the Oxford Mail if you start reading it and I would actually urge you to buy the newspaper because it's 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 easier to read um and and b you know because you can have loads of pop-up ads otherwise and b you can see how it's laid out so you can see all the different columns um have a read of it and don't just buy it one day buy it every day for a week preferably two weeks and then you can actually see kind of where all the slots are who are the columnists what are they writing about where do you think the gaps are where do you think you could fit in thanks Jill really really helpful um and um again what's your perspective on like uh where do you find local contacts for local journalists and, and how would you just do that initial approach Okay, again, actually, the that's covered by um, the previous question in a way, mm. which would be um, do your homework, actually go on to, you know, the radio, listen to the radio station you want you want to be part of, buy the newspaper that you want to be featured in or you want your organisation to be featured in. Um, and also, you know, have a look on the website. Um, I mean, unfortunately, sometimes they can be a little bit out of date, but that's fine. And you can always phone up, you know, um, phone up and ask. My only sort of stipulation on that would be don't phone just before deadline, which for a daily newspaper like the Oxford Mail, don't, you know, try not to phone after about 3 p.m. You know, if you can phone in the morning, phone early, just phone and ask. Look, I'm, I'm an educational um, charity or I run a an educational social enterprise who covers the education stories for the Oxford Mail or the Whitney Gazette or the Abingdon Herald and then they'll happily tell you so that's the easiest way really. Great thanks Jill. Um, some grants wondering um, do you have any advice on on how to use an article or interview if you do manage to get coverage like how could, how could you sort of make sure you maximize that and maybe I'll also maybe put that to Kate as well. So uh, sorry, ask me that again, Henry. Um, if 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 you've managed to get some coverage in in, in some oh, yeah. local media, how yeah. would you then use that to sort of make the most of it? Okay, so um, I would personally, I would share with a link on social media. So you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, um, Insta, whatever you you're using. Um, I would maybe if you do a kind of e-newsletter yourself as an organization send it out send a link um, I definitely follow up just with a simple thank you to the journalist um, but don't bombard them with stuff afterwards you know wait a bit until you pitch again um, I would maybe and the other thing is you know you, as I said you'll, you'll get automatic um, follow on if you like because um, for instance things like BBC uh, Radio Oxford they will go through the the um, Oxford Mail uh, every day and they'll be looking for stories that they can feature on their radio shows so that will automatically bring you coverage on the radio as well usually if it's a good story you know. Brilliant thank you um, I'm just looking through the uh, Kate, do you want to speak to that as well? Because I know you've got some experience on the other side of like how you've made the most. Um, yeah, uh, well, one thing I was just thinking there was um, often if you have an, an interview on the radio, for example, the um, outlet is very happy to share the recording of that with you, the actual file of the like Jack FM will share the recording of your interview um, with you and then you can publish it on your own channels. You can um, share it, transcribe it. Um, yeah, so, so you, you, if you ask, you quite often can get the content. Um, people are happy to share the actual content for you to, to keep on file, to share with your donors, to uh, share on your social media. Um, so yeah, just ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally agree with Kate. And um, of course, you can always upload. Um, you know, as Kate says, if you if you get a copy of the recording or the you know whether it's um, whether it's radio or TV, and then you can actually um, upload to YouTube. And you, you know, you're going to get a much wider viewing of it then as well. Yeah, yeah great. Um, 
uh, Grant's made a quick just a quick follow up on that about I, copyright. Um, is there a is there any are there any issues around that if you're say clipping a sort of BBC News thing? Well, or? what do you think, Kate, on that? I mean, I would um, say if you've asked permission, it's fine. But what do you what do you think? Yeah, yeah so I wouldn't just clip it without checking with them. Um, so I said ask them for the clip, and um, mm. I don't know about yeah. It is something to think about. Um, I I haven't got anything recently from the BBC. Um, but not because I've asked and they've said no. So um, uh, it depends on the organisation, uh, but I wouldn't just take it. Yeah, it's because it is their copyright. Okay. Um, Rebecca is asking, um, yeah, we talked a bit earlier about sometimes stories are getting picked up off social media. If you're no tweeting journalists or just journalists are following you. Um, do you have any tips for sort of writing a social media post that might engage a journalist? Um. Yeah, that is a good way to get noticed, actually, um, you know, is to is to put stuff out on social media um, and it's a mixed, it's a mixed, sorry, I'm hesitating because <laughs> it's a bit of a mixed thing for for a journalist because if, if you're seeing stuff on social media like that, there's one part of you that's pleased because it's a potential story. There's another part of you that absolutely hates it because, of course, every other journalist is going to see that as well. So um, if you've got a good story, my tip is always to go straight to a journalist if you can, because then you can offer it as an exclusive and you'll probably get more coverage. Um, but yeah, no, if you um, social media is definitely a good way to get your organization noticed and you can always, you know, DM um, journalists and so on, because most journalists have their DMs open for obvious reasons, because they do want to be approached with story ideas and so on, you know. Great, thanks. Yeah, I totally again, I think there's another great example of uh, I guess one of the principles of this workshop is to try and put yourself in the shoes of the journalist and what what's going to make life easy for them and and yeah and obviously yeah, yeah all journalists want a, want an exclusive if they can. Um, does anyone else have have other questions for Jill? Um, either shout out or, or pop it in the chat. Um, I just saw actually that Kate had um, pointed mm. out, which is a really good point, that um, journalists' email addresses are, um, you know, next to the articles they write in the Oxford Mail. Um, that's a really good. That's a really uh, good point, Kate, because um, obviously then you can look and you can see who wrote the last um, story for Whitney area or who who wrote the last story for education or health, and that way, um, I mean. You have to be a bit careful because sometimes if somebody's on leave, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, another journalist will ob obviously cover their patch. But by and large, and that's why it's worth just doing your homework and actually following that publication or that radio station um, or blog or whatever it is that you're targeting, sort of stalk them a bit, basically, because that way you're actually going to find out so much more. I mean, that's what I do as a journalist. I have to pitch to editors all the time and what I do is I unashamedly stalk the publication to see what kind of stories are they running in a way I'm in exactly the same situation as as, as everyone on this workshop so you know I'm looking to see what kind of angles are they going for what stories are they running how many words do they use pictures you know um, and, and you can't you can't beat that kind of do your homework aspect yeah, and on the Oxford Mail as well, um, if, you, if you're on an article and you think this is a relevant article to you, you click on the journalist um, who read it on the website, um, and then that will list all of the other articles that they've written so you can see them all in one place. Exactly, um, yeah. So, yeah. Do you go and have a look at the website, it's quite openly available. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would just point out is if you can, I know it's not always that easy, um, but if you can try and plan ahead a bit. So, um, for instance, um, you know, if you know there's um, a report coming out or there's some upcoming legislation, you know, try not to kind of um, phone the journalist or, or message the journalist on the morning, you know, two seconds before it's coming out. Um, you know, if you can alert them, give a he give them a heads up, even if it's only to say, look, just to let you know, there's this debate happening in Parliament next week. Um, they'll be discussing X, Y, Z. Uh, we're interested in that here in Oxfordshire because bloody blah, 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 just to give um, we're going to be having a comment on it. So would you like us to comment on it? And, and that way you've then got their interest in advance 
and then you can obviously give them the comment on the day but you know just give them a bit of advance warning because every journalist needs to go to their news desk basically whether they're radio publications they still have to go to their news desk and say I'd like to do a story on this and then it'll be kind of put in the diary planned in into the coverage so if you can give a bit of notice the, the, the more the better in a way great making note to add that to our slides um it's a really good point grant i think you've got a hand up and then there's a couple more questions in the chat yeah i'm conscious of time so i don't want to hog, hog it but just a quick uh, what i would say is jill just did say earlier you know it's all about the story but i just really wanted to um <laughs> Give a big shout out to her really because ever since i've been in this space which is quite a few years now i think uh, you know she's been a tremendous supporter of social enterprise in particular and you know an early adopter on the old purposeful business side of things so just really a big thanks for that and uh, championing local um social enterprise and cooperatives and the rest of it and then you've probably not got time because i know there's another couple of questions but i was interested to know what you're up to now jill and this organization that henry referred to that you're working on but you might not have time for that uh, yeah, thanks, Grant. That's very nice of you to say that about. Um, Grant's quite right. I've, I, I, I'm a, I really am a huge supporter of social enterprises um, and voluntary organisations. And I know actually that most journalists that I've worked with um, also are always kind of um, keen to try to help local not-for-profit organisations, business for good. You know, we all care about the community that we work in. Um, and that does give you a bit of a, a sort of a leg up really in terms of trying to get coverage um what am i doing at the moment i'm, I'm freelancing doing lots of different things um I'm, I'm doing some work on my most recent story actually was a grant from the european uh, journalism council and i did some work uh, i did a story about um local community organizations so basically organizations uh, very much like your own is with social enterprises and not-for-profits and how they had um helped in the community during COVID and, and that was um, that was published in a publication called Byline Times and also in the Oxford Mail. So that was another good example actually of something that was national and local, although in that case, I pitched it to both outlets. Um, but you can do that as well. There's no reason why you can't do that. You know, if you've got a story that you think spans local to national, you can always, um, again, it goes back to the thing of looking at the publication if it's the guardian that you'd like to target have a look see who's writing stories on you know voluntary organizations or social enterprises um and and you know their email address will be online and just drop them an email and explain what you're doing don't worry about making it word perfect you know just sort of right from the heart effectively just tell them what you're doing explain why you think they might be interested in the story and they'll do the rest great thanks Jill I think we're going to have to leave it there there's a couple more questions in the chat but um I think hopefully um mm. there's a there's a, enough to be getting on with and um someone's offering you an exclusive maybe I know Jill's on Twitter uh, at just a journo if you want to <laughs> want to get hold of her there um, <laughs> I am yeah that's um, right I'll put my um I'll quickly put my um email address in here as well. Thanks. I? So I'm just going to quickly uh, take us back to uh, this uh, the back to our slides just to wrap up and say thanks again to Jill. Really appreciate your input. And as Jill alluded to, it's the second time Jill's given up her time to to help us and help local sort of um, nonprofits and social enterprises sort of do I local do. media better. Um, we also want to thank David Lynch, who was at the Oxford Mail, Caroline O'Connor, Jack FM, who both sort of allowed us to speak to them in advance and it helped us inform this workshop. Um, uh, you know, thanks to the Escalate programme for, for funding the work. And if you want to find out more about that, um, Grant, who's on the call and you've just heard from, is, is a great person to be in touch with. And you can also use the contact details on this slide. Um, OCF have a, a monthly webinar series, which is really I'd really recommend if you're sort of more in the sort of grant funded part of the sector particularly um, uh, and we would really invite feedback from people on the workshop it's the second time that Kate and I have run this um, and um, uh, we hope it's pretty good but I'm sure there's ways it could be better so if you want to um, respond to the, the follow-up email with any feedback we'd really appreciate that um, so there's more events coming up as part of Escalate you can find out more about that on the Escalate website um, and yeah, thank you all for coming. It's been a really, it's been a bit of an intense 90 minutes. So thanks for following us through. I know that Kate and I speak quite quickly. Um, but um, just by way of finishing, thanks again for coming. 
and just get out there and give it a try. There's no magic to this. Um, you guys can all do it um, and let us know how you get on. Um, we'd love to hear from people um, with your successes and you know what you've learned from as well. Um, thank you. So thanks yeah. everyone. Have a great thank morning. You. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everybody. Bye. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs>